parallelization is not a magic bullet, but it's necessary if we want to use the resources that we have available in modern computers. The kind of parallelization that we just did is fairly easy, but limited to one node. It's called shared memory um, parallelism. But let's talk about parallelism a little more generally. One of the first thing that one encounters if one actually wants to discuss how much speed up we can expect, so how much does parallelism, parallelization actually help us, is Amdahl's law. Amdahl's law makes a simple assumption. Our total runtime of a program consists on a single core of the part that cannot be parallelized, the serial part, and the part that can be parallelized, the parallel part. Let's assume the parallel part of our program is actually perfectly parallelizable. That means as we add nodes, we don't add any overhead. It just gets faster and faster and faster. Now, if that is true, then the time that we need with n processors, Tn, is the serial part plus the parallel part divided by n. No overhead. So this is actually an optimal time. Now from that, we can calculate the so-called speed up. So basically the time that we need for one processor divided by the time that we need for n processors. Gives us our speed up um, with respect to the number of nodes that we use. T1 divided by Tn. So far, everything clear? All right. <coughs> so we can um, replace T1 and Tn by the formulas above. And then we get this, that the speed up is actually T serial plus T parallel divided by T serial plus T parallel divided by N. Now, let F be the fraction of our total runtime that is parallelizable. Then we can actually write the speed up like this. One divided by 1 minus f plus f over n. And this is basically Amdahl's law. Now, as a formula, this doesn't look like much, but it has some interesting consequences. So here I plotted the speed up that we would get from this formula when we can parallelize half of our program three quarters of our program, 80%, 90%, and even 95% of our program. If we can only parallelize half of our program, then the other half remains, right? That means we can get a maximum speed up of two. If we can parallelize three quarters of it, one quarter remains, serial, so if we go to an infinite number of processors, the parallel part more or less disappears, and we get a maximum speed up of, hands up, show me your fingers. Yeah, four. If we have 80% parallelizable, what's our speed up? Please show fingers. Come on, fingers. How many fingers, number of speed up? Otherwise, I'll pick on people. 80% can be paralyzed. 20% remain. Maximum speed up of five. All right, that doesn't sound that great yet. Um, let's go to 90%. So one tenth of our code remains serial. 90% can be perfectly paralyzed. What's the speed up? Maximum speed up is 10. And it's not even as if we reach this right away, but 
maybe at 100, 200 processors, we reach a ma this maximum speed up. If we are at 95% of our code parallelizable, the maximum speed up is 20. And look here, at 1,000 processors, I haven't reached this yet. So this means we, of course, want to parallelize way more than just 90%, but even if 99% of our code is perfectly parallelizable, so adding more processors doesn't add any overhead, we achieve a maximum speed up of 100, and we need an awful lot of processors for this, because at 1,000 processors, we are only about um, a speed up of 90. So if you hear those claims when people um, ported their codes to GPUs, graphics cards, and claimed speed ups of 100 and more, they were using a really crappy um, serial code to start with. Because it's pretty much impossible. Um, they don't have that many cores. They have a lot of cores, but not that many. So we have to paralyze a very large portion of our code to really get speed ups of 10, 20, 30. Because in most cases, it won't parallelize perfectly. There will be some communication needed that will um, diminish our speed up. But how do I know which part of my code takes how much time? That's where profiling comes in. A profile shows, for example, how much time your program spends in which function, or possibly on which line of code, or maybe even what computer assembler instruction. But here we'll just look at a function level profiling. What you do here is you run your program under the supervision of another program that keeps track how often a function is called, how long we spend in each function, um, and then provide some summary statistics. In this case, um, we have this pair force function here that is called a million times and takes about five seconds without calls to other functions. Um, total time spend in this function in all sub-functions is seven seconds, which is really most of the total runtime here. So let's look at a brief example. This is a code that simulates some interacting particles. This could be the planets in our solar system, or maybe um, atoms and electrons in a classical model. What we have here is a bunch of particles, and they interact with a pair force. That means a force that only depends on the two particles that we look at, no matter how many other particles we have around. So pair force defines our interaction. A force here calculates the force on one particle due to all the other particles. That is what force does. Calculate all forces does this for every particle. Step um, does one step in our simulation, one time step. So once we calculated all the forces, we can calculate the acceleration based on these forces, and from that, velocities and finally positions. That's then what's done in propagate all variables. Now, this is a typical code. We have those principles in molecular dynamics codes, as well as, for example, simulations of the universe. Not uncommon. All right. Our main program first does some initialization. So here I'm just taking a thousand particles, I have a time step, that's basically um, how far along I move my particles, 
of 0 0.01. And then I initialize my x, y, z coordinates to some random values, my velocities all to zero, and my mass to one. So here I have some massive particles that interact. Then my algorithm actually does the following steps. I first calculate the forces on all particles. And then second step, I propagate all variables for a time step. So if I wanted to parallelize this, where would I start? Well, that's where the profiling comes in. So here's the code for the algorithm. Before I start profiling, though, since a profiler is basically a program that monitors my own program, it does introduce some overheads. And it is good to know how much, because if it's too much, then the results mm, become iffy. If you call a function very, very often, and each function call just has a little bit of overhead, suddenly your, um, the time that you use for that function might have been blown out of proportion. So it's always good to know how much time it actually takes to run our code without the profiler. And here it's 7.34 seconds. Jupyter Notebooks integrate the standard Python profiler. C profile is actually a standard module in Python. It's always available. And the Jupyter Notebooks let you call this just by, um, with this cell magic called prun. Um, a cell magic is a special command, not a Python command, but it belongs to um, IPython, the kernel that we run here. And if it has 2% signs in front of it, it's a cell magic. That means it applies to all of them. You have seen another one, the line magic time it. It only applied to the command that di directly followed. So if we do that um, and run here our um, profile, then we first of all see that the total width profiling was about 8.1 seconds. That's about a 10-15% overhead. That's still okay. We see that pair force here has the most calls and most functions. Then the next one is force. And then it's actually NumPy core multi-array array. We'll have a hard time doing something about this one. But here we have our pair force. Pair force inherently actually, well, takes two particles and calculates a force. It does this independently for each particle. So this one actually would be a good candidate for parallelization. The maximum speed up that we could achieve here, um, well, would be about mm, 60, 70%, so roughly a factor of three maybe if we just paralyze that one. All right. Um, so that's actually the basis. Before you start paralyzing something, measure what actually is worth paralyzing. Start with a function that takes most of the time and try to paralyze that one first. Shared memory parallelism. So what does this actually mean? Alberto already mentioned earlier that within one compute node, and we currently are actually on one of our compute nodes, just like if we had run srun, um, we have 24 cores that share memory. They can all access the same memory. In such a situation, we can use shared memory parallelism. So a parallelism that access the same kind of data. In Python, however, there's a problem. Well, actually, this is not a Python problem per se. It's a problem of the C Python interpreter, which most people use. And maybe it's not even a problem. Maybe it's a feature. Um, but sometimes it becomes a problem. 
the global interpreter lock. Um, the global interpreter lock basically forces the Python interpreter to just run one thread at a time. One thread at a time means it can also only run on one core at a time. Python actually does have a threading module. We can start multiple threads, but the GIL prevents them from running in parallel. So what they actually do is they wait until the previous thread is done, and then the next one, and so on and so on. Um, actually, they can switch context in between, so it's not as if one thread is starved for the entire time. But there's only one thread running at a time. Why did they do that? Well, for two reasons. One, it actually makes serial code somewhat faster. Um, and so far, nobody has shown that they can implement Python without the GIL and still rem keep the same serial speed that we have now. That's one thing. Mm, one can really argue if that is a good argument or not, but anyway, that's what Guido von Rossum, the inventor of Python, decided. The other reason that the GIL actually can be beneficial is that libraries that we call, so if we call into native code, they can be sure that Python won't get in their way. So if I call, for example, NumPy and let it do a matrix matrix multiplication, then NumPy can use all these threads and do the matrix matrix multiplication without having to worry about what Python does at the same time because it won't do anything. So it makes this kind of um, composed parallelism actually easier because we only have one level to compose. Now, this kind of is a problem if we actually want to do parallel computing with Python. But fear not, number to the rescue. I told you that number is a compiler. So Numba actually takes Python and generates native code. If it generates native code and runs in no Python mode, it can actually leave the GIL to, its, to whatever it wants and just do its own threading. So that's actually what we did already, right? When we did the vectorize with the parallel, we used number to run on multiple threads and still called it from Python. So we have done it, we know it works. The kind of vector-based parallelism that I showed you is not the only way of parallelizing code. Um, actually, that operation that we did there is called a map. We are applying an operation to every element um, separately and then get a result. But another form of parallelism that sometimes can be mapped to a map is loop-based parallelism. Let's go back to our calculation of pi with our Monte Carlo method. But, well, when we did that previously with the vectors, we first generated our random numbers. Um, you might have noticed that the value of pi was not very precise that you got. Um, you can use way more random numbers, like 10 to the 9. Um, but when you do that, you also start to use gigabytes of memory. And that's not really necessary because we don't need all those points. All we need to know is when we picked a point, was it in the circle or not? And how many of them were in the circle? We could write a loop like this. We could say, OK, I take n points. I pick a, or I um, choose an x and a y value, here using random, uniformly between 0 and 1. 
In this case, um, I check if the um, the length of the or the distance of the point from the center is within the circle, and if it is, then I increase my number of hits. Now, actually, <coughs> this is not quite as trivially paralyzed. This part up here, yes, it's all good, but this, we ac well actually want to add up. So if we parallelize this, put it in four different threads, each doing the same thing, what do we do with the hits? We actually want to get the matches from all of them. We want to reduce, actually sum up, all of the hits that we get. There are different ways of doing this. This is called a reduction. And in this case, it's simply the sum. Luckily, Namma can do that. So let's parallelize that using p range. Python doesn't have a p range. p range is something that comes from number and requires that we actually tell our function that it's allowed to do something in parallel. So here I do my parallel mcpy <coughs> and um, I add the parallel equal true statement or keyword argument. I also have here no Python equal true so that it warns me if I am calling into the Python interpreter. Now down here now I simply replace the range with the p range. By the way if you don't say parallel equal true p range just maps directly to range. And number actually takes care of quite a number of things. First of all it recognizes that there is a reduction um, taking place here and um, takes care of proper reduction variables so that each thread can add it up separately and then in the end combine all the results. It even goes further. It makes sure that the random number generator is initialized with a different seed for each thread because otherwise it would just generate the same points in each thread which is not really what we would want to do. <coughs> So this code actually parallelizes nicely with a simple p range. Um, so this was loop-based parallelism. And if you ever hear about OpenMP, that's actually what they do. About to mention OpenMP, and I said we will do something similar. Actually, OpenMP is one of the schedulers that num uh, Numba can use. There's also task-based parallelism. Um, with task-based parallelism, I define a set of tasks that I want to do and some dependencies between those tasks. Often, I won't even execute the tasks right away when I define them, but have a delayed execution. Here, for example, these are just dummy tasks. All they do is sleep. But it's a good example for illustration. So imagine I have some input tasks. They are fairly fast. I have a common task, which I need in preparation for everything else that I do that takes a little longer, actually six times as long as this input task. I have a map item task, which does some map. In this case, it just sleeps for two seconds. And I do a reduction in the end, some summary. So this is a typical pattern, actually very similar to what we've just seen. I first create a set of input tasks, in this case 24 of them. And um, you will recognize this as a list comprehension from yesterday. Then my common data here comes from my common task. My intermediates are the map item tasks and each of these map item tasks takes an item from the prepared input task and the common data that's generated here from the common task. So I create a dependency between item, common task and my map item. 
Finally, here my summarized task takes all the intermediates, so all these map items, as input. So my summary task depends on all the other tasks. That can be nicely visualized as a graph. And down here we start. These are our input tasks. The bigger circle here is our common task. It's longer. More input tasks. Now here are um, the results. The squares are the output. Then I get to my intermediate task and notice that all of them depend on the common task and on one of the input tasks. Again, they generate some output. And the summarized task depends on all the um, intermediate tasks or the results of the intermediate task and generates its own result. Two things can be nicely seen in this graph. First of all, we have different levels of parallelism. Everything that can be done in one plane can be done in parallel. So here we actually have 25 tasks that we can do in parallel. Here we have 24, so one less. <coughs> and here we have only one. Can't redo really it in parallel anymore. <coughs> so that's the first thing to learn from this. Even an algorithm might have different or inherently different levels of parallelism, available parallelism. <coughs> so these are things that I could do in parallel if I have the resources. The other thing is we can actually find a critical path here. <coughs> Let me assume for now, and on Eureka this is true, that I can do these input tasks much faster than the common task. So the common task is really what limits my speed here. So I have the common task to do, the map item task, and the summarized task. If I add those tasks up, I get six seconds. And that is actually exactly also what I see when I do a time out on this, when I actually compute the result. Not until I do the compute here um, is it actually computed. The tasking framework that I was using here is called DASK, and it's quite popular. But there are others. TensorFlow really is a tasking framework, and there are lots of other tasking frameworks that try to do something like this. One disadvantage of tasking frameworks is that, just like using multiple threads, tasks also have an overhead. So your tasks have to be long enough to be worth spreading and if you have very short tasks, you basically can't use this. One cool thing um, about Dask is that it doesn't ha just have a scheduler that works with shared memory, but also Dask distributed, which actually can run on multiple nodes. And we could take the same graph that we just saw and run it on multiple nodes without having to do any other changes. It will actually take care of transporting the data and trying to make sure that it keeps the data local so that it transfers as little data between nodes as possible, which is quite nice and a fairly easy way of getting, um, of parallelizing across multiple nodes. All right, and that is perfect timing for our coffee break. Alberton mentioned MPI, the message passing interface, as the de facto standard for communicating between different nodes. So in this lecture, I'll give you a short introduction to MPI. Let's start with a bunch of nodes. So what's a node here? A node for me is something that has computing capabilities and memory and a network. 
It used to be, when MPI started, that a node consisted of a single core processor and some memory. And the single core processor was assigned a rank. And we had a direct mapping between the rank, the logical node, and the hardware node. On modern computers, each processor has multiple cores. And we can decide to use those multiple cores like we just did with some shared memory programming. Or we could use them directly from within MPI and basically treat each of these cores as if they were separate nodes. For our discussion here, this doesn't really matter much. For performance, though, it may. So imagine you have a bunch of nodes. Each of these nodes has a processor, has some memory, has a network card. And we want them to talk to each other. So they will talk through the network that they have in common. And they will, from a program point of view, use communicators. An MPI communicator is just a bunch of nodes that can talk to each other and that have been started together, launched together, using actually a job schedule like Slurm. The first thing that MPI does when a job like that was started and we initialize it is it first checks, okay, how many nodes are there and which ones are there. So it kind of takes an inventory. And then the nodes decide among each other which node gets which number. This number is called the rank. And we usually start counting at 0 and then up to um, n minus 1, where n is the number of MPI ranks that I launched here. All of these ranks can be um, accessed through MPI COM world. So the COM world communicator, the world communicator, is always available. MPI initializes it automatically when we um, initialize MPI. So we now have a communicator. But how do we talk to each other? There are two basic communication patterns. The first one is point-to-point -point communication. We're basically sending a message from one of these um, ranks, in this case from rank 1, to rank 0. Um, I'm also sending you one from rank 5 to rank 2, from rank 3 to rank 2. Um, these are independent messages. And so we are passing some data, in this case from 1 to 0. And that's where this whole thing got its name from. We are passing messages. So it's the message passing interface, or MPI. Send-receive is the simplest form of communication. I basically, um, in the send command, I'm telling where I want to send my data to. I say what kind of data I'm transferring, how much. I can assign a tag that basically says this message has tag A or tag special or whatever. Um, so these, and then the corresponding receive actually has to match all of this. It has to be on the right node that I am sending the data to. It has to expect the right data type, um, has to have room for the data. So the right amount, and also if we specify a tag, has to have the same tag. So send and receive come in pairs.
Send and receive can be blocking or non-blocking. There, there are actually two different commands. Um, blocking means I wait until the whole send receive is completed. Non-blocking means kind of a fire and forget. So once I send this, I can proceed to the next line in my code. Receive then will um, try to receive the data and you have to do it multiple times. Actually the command for doing it um, non-blocking would be I send and I receive. Basically I could do everything just with send and receive. I have a way to transfer data, send messages from A to B. And from that I could build up all my communication patterns. But this is neither convenient nor necessarily performant. That's why there are also collective communications. Collective communication means I wanna, I'm involving all of the processes, all of the MPI ranks um, that are in my communicator in a single command. For example, here I'm collecting some data. Maybe I want to sum up all my hits that I had from the Monte Carlo. I could do it like this. Um, node one, or rank one, sends its data to rank zero, so does rank two, three, four, and five. This is actually what MPI for Pi does when you use the lowercase versions of the commands, and I'll talk a little about, more about that later. But this may not be the smartest way, especially if we have lots of processes. This means that node zero is actually my bottleneck. Everything has to go to node zero, and then there's some serial operation that needs to be performed on node zero only. I could use a different pattern. For example, I could do it like this. Um, I could first add up the data from one and two and then send the result from to node zero. In parallel, I could add up the data from three and four on rank five <coughs> and then send the result to node zero. This tree-like pattern is actually a fairly common pattern for reductions, like summing up all the results of a calculation because it allows you to keep things as parallel as possible for as long as possible. Other um, communicators like that uh, or other commands like that besides reduce are scatter, gather, there's a broadcast. Um, there are a couple of other commands that do collective communication. The one thing to keep in mind is that collective communications always involve all the ranks of a communicator. Now I'm talking about a communicator or not the communicator because I can generate new ones. MPI com world is always there. It's what MPI initializes when we start. However, I might just want to use a subset of my processes for a particular part of my job then I can generate my own communicator from, and basically drive a new communicator from MPI com, com world. Now, MPI is not really meant to be interactive. Yet, we want to use it at least for this course within the Jupyter Notebooks. And for that, we use a little trick. Um, we actually combine two packages. We'll use IPy Parallel. IPy Parallel was developed together with, well, the predecessor of the Jupyter Notebooks to provide some interactive parallel programming. The problem with IPy Parallel is communication there is always with the notebook. Actually with the controller, but it's always from the engines to the controller and back, so there's always this bottleneck. But we can start IPy parallel also so that it supports MPI, and that's what we're going to use. So when we want to start MPI, we first need to 
imported from the MPI for Pi package. MPI for Pi pretty much became the standard for using MPI within Python. It used to be much more complicated, but now it's actually fairly trivial. Um, this magic here does not belong to MPI, but belongs to our Jupyter Notebooks and makes sure that these commands are actually executed um, within the MPI job and not on our notebook. So when I do import MPI here, I automatically call MPI init. So whereas in a C or Fortran program, I would have to do this explicitly, here it's pretty much done automatically. So I don't have to worry about it. Here I'm getting the, just the version but note that I'm actually doing it, that I get four results. That's because I started four engines here and I actually have four tasks, uh, four ranks in my uh, MPI job. Now, the first thing that you usually do is um, get a copy because MPI Com World is kind of a long name to write all the time. So usually you assign it to some variable. You get your local rank and usually you want to know how many ranks are involved in your job. Now, the same program will run on each node. So how do we do things differently on different nodes? Well, we do distinctions based on the rank. But first, let's get our typical Hello World program out of the way. So here I'm just printing a message from all four um, nodes and actually um, the IPy parallel keeps them in nice order. It actually collects the output from each of them and gives them in the right order out. If you ran this program from a command line, you might get the messages actually in different order, depending on who's fastest. Point-to-point -point communication, let's start with that. Um, Python provides a lot of help. Each Python function comes with its own documentation usually built in, in form of doc strings. So does MPI. Now, in this case, we actually need to access the MPI com send on, um, that's within the MPI job. So we can do it like this. We can use the PX magic and then call help. And here, for example, it tells us that com send with the capital S here takes a buffer. The self argument is actually the communicator. Takes a and we don't have to list that explicitly, takes a buffer, an integer, and a tag, which is also an integer. Buffers are arrays that follow the buffer protocol. The buffer protocol is basically a Python specification that says, here's a chunk of memory, and here's a way how you access it. Okay, let's look at a parallel reduction. Um, and here I'm showing you how you can do things differently depending on the rank. You basically use, use if statements. Here, for example, only rank zero, so only one process actually, um, generates random numbers. Um, and actually generates 100,000 times the number of ranks that I have in total numbers. All other processes assign a non to A. Here then, I um, declare a, another variable called A partial, which is an empty NumPy array, which means I allocate space for it, but I don't initialize it. I don't put any values in there. 
And then I can call comScatter and notice that this is called from all ranks. Um, with A, the data that I want to scatter, and a partial, the data that I want to receive. It would also take another argument, root, which by default is set to zero. But I could scatter from another rank. It doesn't have to be zero. <clears throat> now, each of my ranks could sum up its partial result. And then afterwards, I call com reduce. Um, notice that I this time use the lowercase version. Um, the lowercase versions are often more convenient. They can take arbitrary objects. They return values, mm, but they're fairly slow. The uppercase versions, like this one, usually take buffers and map directly to the underlying C library and are fairly fast. So if you want to do numerics, you usually want to use the uppercase versions, but sometimes the lowercase versions are simply very convenient. So this was done again on all nodes. However, printing I'm doing only on node zero again. And it gives me the sum of the random numbers and the average. So I have gather both as an uppercase and a lowercase version. <coughs> I used to have quite a bit of problems with the uppercase versions in my notebooks. So I actually kind of commented this out, not executing it. Um, they seem to be working, but I didn't want to risk it for this group. So here I'm just showing the lowercase version. Um, and again, it's executed on all of them. And gather here collects all the data and puts it in a list of arrays. <clears throat> 